Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my brand new Let's Play. My name is Siparos, and this is Tyranny, a g brand new game that was released two days ago, 10th of November 2016. This game was developed by Obsidian Entertainment and published by Paradox Interactive. Now, truth to be told, I wasn't planning to play this game for quite some time still. I was planning to play 3-4 other games before this, but like I have mentioned in my previous videos, each of them are having their own problems when it comes to recording. The games themselves are running and playing just, fu just fine, uh, last time I tested them, but when it comes to recording, they are not, uh, they are not they're not being recorded exactly like, like I, how I wanted, wanted them to. Like, in this one game's case, case the game, none of my game recorders record the actual in-game in cinematics. And, and, some, and sometimes uh, they, can, they will record the actual gameplay, but not my voice. And in some cases it records the voice and game sound, but not the actual gameplay, and so on and so forth. It's really fast frustrating. And so I decided that, you know what? I'm gonna let's play Tyranny, the brand new game that I've been, see, the brand new CRPG that I've been wait, waiting for a very long time. Ever since this game was uh, officially announced uh, many months ago, at some point, at some point this year. So yeah, and, and and one more thing, I actually did record this first episode of this let's play yesterday, um, and then that. that that episode focused completely on character creation because in these type of games it 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 can take quite long, maybe even hours, to create your own character because you have to customize the character's looks, pick the gender, of course, uh, customize the stats, uh, the character's background, character's background, your class, or in this case the weapon weapon special specializations because there is no actual classes in this game. So yeah, now th there were lots of decisions and choices to be made, and then I also had to make up the name for the character that I didn't even think about before. So yeah, and, and when I finished the episode, finished the episode, and I uploaded to YouTube, I I, I noticed and then I, and then I noticed that the episode was one hour and forty two minutes long, and it was all about the character creation. So I thought that you know what, screw it, I'm not gonna make um, make you sit uh, sit through all of that. So I'm gonna so I'm gonna rec record the first episode again, and now now that I have now that I know what, what what to expect from the character creation, pretty much. So without further ado, let's start a new game. These are the normal uh, difficulty levels. We are we are we are we are going with normal here because be because it's the first time for me to play this game. So this is obviously a blind let's play because brand new game. Then in case you're wondering what these are, these are this is expert. Expert, mo expert mode that is a disables a number of helper features in the game, and this is trial of uh, trial of trial of iron is basically a hardcore mode which I, which allows you to have only one safe, and if you and if your party uh, is defeated, the game is over. You have to start all, all over again. Well, naturally, we're not, we're not going to pick either of those two. We are just going to pick normal and be done with it. So what this game is about then? Well, this game, this game is an, like I said, it's an old school role playing game, very similar to the uh, old uh, role playing games from the 90s, like Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate, Planescape Torment, Icewind Dale, and the more modern uh, old school role playing games like Pillars of Eternity, which was really, which was also made by the same developers. Then Wasteland 2, Divinity Original Sin, and so on and so forth. This is a, so this is this is basically a game like that. So there's going to be a lots of reading. Uh, the, we, we see the characters and the environment from isometric perspective, and the combat combat here is real time with a pause system. So basically the same same system Pillars of Eternity had. Another thing that that makes this game very what that made made this game very interesting to me and to many other people is the fact that that the evil has won in this uh, universe. The the empire Kyros's empire, which is basically the bad guy of this game, has basically they basically taken over the entire world. Well, 90, 95 percent of the world. There is still a small corner who is still fighting back, but overall the evil has pretty much triumphed. And we play as one of his uh, fate binders, which are basically law enforcers who enforces Kyros's law uh, across uh, across the lands. So we are playing as a bad guy, ba uh, basically. No other role-playing game has ever done done that be done this before, as far as I know. Oh, there we go. For over four hundred years, 
The armies of Kairos the Overlord have swept across the known world. All who stood against them fell before their might. Even the Archons, women and men of immense power, were forced to kneel, chained to the Overlord's will. Now Kairos' final conquest has come to our corner of the world, and two of the Overlord's armies compete for the honor of taking our lands. The elite disfavored, and the teeming horde of the Scarlet Chorus. The voices of Narad, spymaster and archon of secrets, guides the fierce and undisciplined masses of the Scarlet Chorus. With each battle, the Scarlet Chorus grows stronger as the defeated are given a simple choice. Serve or die. Grave and Ash, Archon of War and the Overlord's most loyal general, leads the disfavored. Though small in number, Kairos' ironclad legion has never met true defeat in open battle. Watching over the two generals is Tunan, the Adjudicator. Archon of Justice, eldest of Kairos' minions. Tunan brings Kairos' laws to newly conquered lands, aided by the Fatebinders, judges and executioners of the Overlord's laws. You were among the youngest of the court of Fatebinders when Kairos' armies came to our lands. How could we have known that the fate of thousands would rest in your hands? I'm very excited here, folks. All right, and now we are at the character crea creation, and we are going to focus on this entire. We are going to focus on this character creation only in this episode, and in the next episode, we actually start. We actually start to play the game. Now, first and foremost, you pick your uh, gender and the body type, which is a very nice touch. The only real complaint that I well, not really a complaint, complaint, but one thing, one thing that I would have really wanted to see in this game are uh, is other races. You can only play as humans here. There's no dwarves, elves, or any other generic fantasy uh, races here, and that's a bit, and that's a shame because I like to play uh, basically anything but humans in uh, fantasy role-playing settings like this. But hey, what can you do? So we're gonna play as male, and this will do. Then we're gonna pick a face type, which is kind of weird because I don't think that face that we are gonna see our faces a lot because it's from isometric perspective and everything. But hey, it's nice to have the choice. Mm. Let's go with this and here. And there's also portraits there we can pick. This is actually very this is actually good enough, so we'll go with that. Now let's see what if we can we find a hairstyle which is very similar similar to this guy's. This is quite close. Where was that? Yeah, this is good enough. Let's go with this. Hair color, black, that's fine. Then we can pick uh, our tattoos. I don't know, do these tattoos have any specific meaning or or, or if these are just for... Uh, or, or if, if this, this is just an aesthe a, a aesthetic uh, thing. Just add it for fun. This is actually nice, so we'll go with that. Red, red is always good jo color of choice. Oh wait, maybe this is slightly better. Yeah, this is simple and simple and good enough. Or should we add another color? Nah, I think this red is fine. Let's let's continue. Now we pick our history here. Now I'm not gonna 
I'm not going to go and read all of these because one one main reason why the <coughs> excuse me why the first epi first version of this episode that I made was so long was because I was literally reading all of these all of these stuff here. So I'm not going to read them this time. I'm just going to hover my mouse over there. So if you want to read them, you can just pause the video and uh, and read them for yourself. So we could play, play as a character who used to be a pit fighter, a hunter, guild apprentice, noble scion, soldier, lawbreaker, or just a criminal, uh, to, be, to, be it, to put it simple, a war mage, or battle mage, or a di diplomat. But the one we are going to play now is hunter. Well, I'm, I'm gonna read this one. When the leader of your home village spoke out of turn one time too many, agents of the overlord put the whole town to the torch to contain the spread of insub in insubordination. The Bounding Viper tribe came across the smoking ruins of your village, and when the beast's matriarch found you frozen but un unafraid, the mighty leader took you in and raised you with the protection of her tribe. For years you lived with these wild beastmen in the migratory homes throughout the mountains, but the Bounding Vipers were a dying breed. Each long winter took a greater toll than the last, and once the dwindling tribe was too weak to defend its lands, disfavored... <coughs> Excuse me. And in case you wonder what the disfavored... Well, I, I, I think we can at least, at least take a look at this. Disfavored. Disciplined and battle-hardened, the, the, dis, the disfavored are, are an elite legion in Karras' armies. They, they spearheaded the conquest of the younger realms, fighting themselves always outnumbered, but never outclassed. Led by the steadfast and dutiful Craven Ash, whom they follow with obsessive devotion, they are committed of, to, expo to imposing their interpretation of order upon the relative lawless of the tears. The Legion only tolerates northerners in their ranks, priding themselves on their high standards and cultural purity. So that's his favorite. So this favorite soldiers came to dispense of, of the ravenous scavengers your tribe had become. Fighting a human amongst the wild tribe, the disfavored soldiers made a point of taking you alive. News of the wild child of the north eventually spread to the Archon of Justice, and he ordered you released from cap and he ordered you released from captiv captivity and delivered onto his court. And I think, and I guess we can we can uh, read this also real quick so you know what these uh, words, names, and terms mean. Too known to educator is the Archon of Justice, ruler of the conquered realms, and tributor and art. Arbiter, arbiter of disputes, oldest of the Archons sent to conquer the tears, to none speaks with Kairos' authority. His true, his true appearance remains hidden behind an iron mask, the face of judgment. Tunon is an impartial, sober creature wholly obsessed with justice and honor. Though assumed to be a powerful com combatant, Tunon rarely sprays from his throne room entrusting his court of fate binders to act as his eyes and ears, as well as judges, juries and executioners. So fate binders, th th those, those fate binders, that we are going to be one of those fate binders who are going to uh, work his work as his eyes and ears and spread and spread the laws of Kairos. So that's who we are. And speaking about Kairos, Kairos is a name of our of Ka sorry, Kairos is a name out of legend. For centuries, the Overlord has con consolidated power, sending vast armies to swallow entire realms. The most powerful mystic the world has ever seen. Kairos can issue edicts, magical pro procl uh, proclamations that level cities, spread pucks, sunder the lands, or change the course of seasons. So he sounds like a guy you don't want to mess with. The Archons, the masters of magic throughout the known world, bow to Kairos, and the Overlord, Overlord readily destroys any Archons unwilling to kneel. These sorcer sorceresses and madmen led, by, led the Overlord's armies in near-endless conquest. As the realms of the known world fall to the Overlord, these captured territories are divided up, up, div divide up amongst the Archons to manage. Able to, de able to deliver suffering and woe to every corner of Teratus without leaving the capital, few have seen the Overlord in person. 
though Karus's name is in the single most recognized name in the world, only the Archons can say what the Overlord looks like. Very mysterious. So yeah, we are going... Is there anything else? Uh, the Voices of Nerad. Known in his official capacity as the Archon of Secrets, the Voices of Nerad is equal, parts, genius and madman. Rumors abound that he can steal the minds of others, though few, if any, are alive to confirm as such. The subjects of, he of his interrogation are never heard from again, and the Archon is able to recall the memories of his victims with startling accuracy. He is, he is the inconsistent leader of the Scarlet Chorus, vacillating between commanding from the vanguard and directing his armies in ab absentia. Despite his strange methods, no one doubts that the voice of Voices of Nerad is an, ac is an accomplished strategist, even suggesting that his madness stems from thinking hundreds, perhaps thousands of steps ahead of his enemies. Sounds very sinister. I think that's pretty much... Well, I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be more of this stuff, but we are going to read them. Well, we are going to read them all when the time... We are going to read them all, don't worry. So yeah, we are going to go with Hunter, because I like the idea of a wild man who has been raised by beastmen. And now, like I mentioned earlier, this, has, this game has no specific classes, like in Pillars of Eternity, for example. So there's no paladins, uh, mages, necroma necromancers, barbarians, rogues, or anything else specifically like that. But you can play as something very similar. This, this is not a class-based game, but uh, you can just... But you... Uh, you can... Uh, select your uh, combat style and what I'm gonna go with is javelin. Wielding a javelin is a good compromise between me melee and ranged. Drone weapons deal more damage than bows but cannot attack from as far away. They also have the benefit of being able to switch between ranged and melee attacks depending on the enemy distance. And, and the skills we are gonna get is drone weapons, dodge, parry and athletics. So this is going to be our primary uh, expertise. And we are going to go with hard shot because uh, this sounds this sounds more a bit a little bit more powerful than hubble. So we are going to go with hard shot. Then next we are going to pick, pick a secondary expertise, and for this playthrough, I think I'm gonna. Hmm. Oh wait, I actually didn't notice this before. Spear. Ah, this is slightly different than the first expertise ones because. If you can, if you look at here, there's like things like great sword, but then we, when we uh, continue, it's war maze all of a sudden. So yeah, I didn't notice this before. So let's see what we have here. Spear and sh spear and shield. Wielding a sword and shield puts you in front of li line of combat, standing between enemies and your allies. Holding a shield will slow down your attack rate slightly, but give you good defensive bonuses. All right. There's also different magic uh, types we can learn, but I'm not gonna play as any magic user in this in this let's play anyway. Plus, magic users have never really interested me that much uh, re recent years when it comes when it comes to games like this. Usually, I play as something like paladin or warrior or rogue or something like that. A short bow, war mace. Wielding a two-handed weapon puts your focus on power rather than speed. This is a slow attack style, but the damage you deal will often overcome the armor of your enemies. All right, javelin. Can we pick the javelin for the second time? Apparently. But I was thinking of uh, going with dual wield. Yeah, we're gonna go with dual wield. Wielding two weapons give give you the advantage of versa versatility versatility and as each weapon can deal different types of damage what do we have here flurry of bow Bl flurry of blows i was gonna say flurry of bows but you know it's blows unleash a double attack on your target or slice a carefully placed attack that attempts to open a major artery leaving the target bleeding that sounds brutal so we are gonna go with that all right so javelin and shield and dual wielding sounds good And then we are ha we can pick our colors. I don't I don't I don't know will these colors uh, um, change eventually when we get uh, new pieces of gear. But hey, we'll see. I think I'm gonna go with this. This looks very nice. Nice mixture of uh, red and green. And then we are gonna customize our banner. 
And this whole banner customization here reminds me of the banner customization feature in Diablo 3. Now since we are a, since we are we were raised by beastmen, I want a very savage looking banner. So we are gonna go with this. That looks very savage, doesn't it? Unless I'm missing something. Something that would look even better. There's quite a nice amount of options here. No, this is good enough. So, the banner could be green and the mark could be red. That looks nice. Yeah. Perfect. Then name. The name I this, uh, this this was also one of the reasons why the first episode lasted so long because I couldn't make up a good damn name. I actually had to make a I actually had I actually had to pause the recording and to think about it some more. But the name we are gonna go with is Rulecock. Sounds very simple and maybe kind of I don't know maybe a barbarish kind of kind of name. Maybe the beastmen could have given us this uh, name. Uh, name for us, Rurkak. Sounds very appropriate. Then continue and attributes. So these these balls here uh, me, me, uh, means means attributes that the game is recommending for us uh, based on the weapon expertise uh, choices we made. Quickness is the most recommended one. So we're gonna let's put five there. Might as well. Uh, might determines. Determine, determine, determines the physical strength of a character. Increasing might leads to more powerful attacks and stronger abilities, as well as increasing the endurance defense. Hmm, I guess we're gonna put at least... Well, what's, what's finesse? The finesse attributes describes, describes a character's physical and mental precision. Finesse is used to determine accuracy of attacks and spells, as well as increasing worn armor's chances to reduce a hit type. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna... Put some points here. Now, now let's see if, what are, what is vitality. De determine determines a character's physical health and their physical and and the strength of personality. It also increases the will de defense. Will defense. What's will defense? The will defense opposes attacks that are mentally based and like confusion. It is defined by characters' resolve and wits attributes and can be modified by equipped items, talents, and effects from spells and potions. All right. Hmm. And oh, a witch. The witch attributes describes a character's mental accuracy, their ability to observe the environment and pick up clues. Witch is used to increase spell strength as well as increase the magic defense. Well, I don't think that we are going to use. Uh, well, I, I, I just don't think that witch is going to be very useful for us. So we are going to reduce it by two at least, and we can actually reduce it any more, any more than that. All right, fair enough. Resolve determines a character's ability to endure physical and mental challenges. Resolve is the primary attribute used to derive the endurance, will, and magic defenses. It also increases the duration of afflictions applied by the character. Hmm. I think we can reduce this by nine. Eh, not nine, one. Couple points there, and I guess we can put. Finesse. Hmm. So now we have fifteen percent more accuracy and plus five armor armor deflection. Yeah, this looks very nice. Yeah, let's go with that. Then weapon skills, uh, dual wielding and drawn weapons. Are recommended for us of course and we have 20 points available which is very nice I don't know let's put 40 points there and maybe 35 for there is good enough athletics determines a character's ability to traverse difficult terrain as well as their ability to execute complicated moves in combat athletics is also used in dialogue to determine your ability to int intimidate or physically up or overpower someone this skill is strongly recommended for you because of your training in javelin and dual wielding so let's put at least. Let's take some of some of away from there, and let's put at least 40 to athletics. Sounds good enough for me. The dodge skill def defends against range attacks from blows, javelins, or magic spells. A higher skill ranks will reduce damage taken or even cause enemies to miss their attacks altogether. Five there and hmm.
I think I can take a bit at least maybe 33 for there and 2 for their drone weapons. So we have 40 in drone weapons because of our training in javelin and then athletics. This looks good, I guess. Alright, let's go. And then, how do you want to continue? Selecting the Conquest option will allow you to play through Karas' Conquest of the Tears, choosing how your character was, was involved in the invasion. This gives you the most control over the starting state of the game and how, uh, and, and how other factions will react, re, will react to your character. So of course we are going to go with the Conquest option here. Now, and this is the other reason why the last video was, was taking so long, and it's going to make this video last quite long as well, but not as long as the last one, I hope. Because I pretty much know what to expect. I know what to expect this time. Oh, next. All the world has fallen to Kairos. And now the Overlord's eye is on the Tears. Our home. The last corner of the world free of Kairos's reign. Two armies. The Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus march south from the Northern Empire. The last realm to fall to Kairos a century prior. In the early days of 428, Kairos' armies arrive at the Gates of Judgment, the mountainous border that we Tearsmen so long believed unassailable. Unable to agree on a unified plan of defense, the various leaders of the Tears sit and wait for each other to deal with the conquerors. Until it's too late. Conquest. During the Conquest, you will decide your character's actions during Kairos' invasion of the Tears, shaping the world through which you will adventure over the course of the game. Each choice you make affects your character and how major factions of the Tears respond to you. Your decisions matter. Choose wisely. Oh, I will. 428 TR. Year 1 of Kairos' Conquest. Oh, this looks very cool. The Bastard City. The Bastard City. What's Bastard City? Named for its position between two realms, the Northern Empire and the Southern Tears, the Bastard City and its surrounding lands, known as the Bastard Seer, is a melting pot of cultures and a place of commerce and intrigue. Intri 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 yeah, this game is going to have uh, quite a few uh, very uh, weird and new words that I have never seen before, so excuse me if I'm uh, pronouncing or spelling them incorrectly. Anyway, the Tearsmen of the South view the Bastard City as a place of wealth and excess, but to the people of the Northern Empire, the Bastard City is little more than a sprawling slum. Too known to educate to establish his court in the, Bastard, in the Bastard City. From his foothold in the Tears, he and his court of Fatebinders impose Kairos' laws upon the conquered land. Alright, so the Bastard City stood on the northern border between Kairos' empire and the Tears. Built upon a natural harbor at the crossroads between realms, the city was a nexus of commerce. To the, to the tears, it was the center of all wealth. To a northerner, it was little more than a backwater trading post. Its symbolic state status as a gateway to the continent made it a natural first target in Karas' military conquest. Circumstances were ideal for you to prove your worth as a soldier in Karas' armies. Taking this city would send a message to the rest of the of rest of the tears. Kairos' will is insurmountable. Insurmountable? Yeah, I think that's how you say it. Alright, so we got two options here. Infiltrate the tears. History would remember the Gates of Judgment as the first battle of the conquest, but the real combat unfolded with advanced units of both armies preparing for the for the coming war. The disfavored and Scarlet Soros. Scarlet's, the Scarlet Soros is little more than a gang of gang, gang of thugs and their captive slaves. Rather than organize under commissioned officers, the Chorus follow a hierarchy seemingly ruled by whoever has the bravado to command and defend their position. At the head of this at the head of this chaotic pecking order, the Archon of Secrets, better known as the Voices of Nerat, treats the Scarlet Chorus as his personal army. The Scarlet Chorus often suffers tremendous losses after battle, only to swell in the aftermath when co co captured enemies and co collateral prisoners are given the cruel opportunity to join or die. Did we? Nah. 
Uh, look at the disfavored already. Oh yeah, we read that one already. So any, so anyway, uh, so we got two options here: aid the disfavor, disfavored scouts. You lent, you lent your skills to the elite disfavored scouts to capture a border garrison, Craven Ash, Craven Ash, Craven Ash, the last of the great northern generals to stand against the overall in ages past. Archon Craven Ash now serves Kairos as supreme commander of the disfavored legion and is charged with conquering the tears. Craven Ash shares a powerful bond with the soldiers under his command that and regards each of them as family. Well, that sounds nice. The death of a soldier at enemy hands represents a grievous loss to the old general who bears the burden of his love with mournful stoicism. He sounds like a nice guy. So Craven Ash insisted that an early victory in the offensive would boost, in the, boost the morale of his troops and diminish the haughty overconfidence of the southerners. And with Scarlet Soros, he joined the Scarlet Soros as they raided villages and small towns, conscripting every able-bodied man and woman into the army. The voices of Nerad in, in, emphasizes, emphasized the rewards of cons conscription and enslavement over random bloodshed. Apparently his soldiers needed the remi apparently his soldiers needed needed the reminder. All right, and then there's this choice: Gates of Judgment. The armies of Kairos took the battle to the Gates of Judgment, trumpeting the, op the op opening call of the conquest of the Tears. The two armies brought their distinctive distinctive sense of order and chaos to the assault. You went to battle alongside the army whose approach best suited your strengths. So, disfavored. Strand in shield to shield with Kairos' iron-clad elite, you, adva you advanced on the mercenary army pur purchased by the nobles of the bastard city. The legion wanted to send a message to the tears that superior breathing and dis disciplined training would win the day. And Scarlet Chorus. You rushed with the chaotic mass of the Scarlet Chorus, flank flanked the bastard city's armies and then drove them to flee. Hmm. Well, I, I imagine that my guy is a rather wild type of person who doesn't really care about much about order or discipline, for at or at, or, or at least to the point where he where he is have to uh, follow the rules. So I I would I think that Scarlet Chorus is more of his style. So let's pick this, and whether we pick this or the Gates of Judgment or. Infiltrate the tears. Hmm. Yeah, let's just let's just let's just go full face and let's go to Gate of Judgment and and with and and we go face with the Scarlet Cor Chorus boys. You caught the mercenary army unprepared for the ma for the mania and disorder of the Scarlet Chorus. Your forces overwhelmed the tears' defenses in a few hours. Hacking and burning their way into the continent. Any mercenaries who survived the battle found themselves initiated into the Scarlet Chorus, tortured by ruthless in interrogate inter interrogators, all made this sport of competition as the army marched ruthlessly forward. And more choices to judge the enemy. The soldiers of the Tears fell by the hundreds, and Kairos' armies could not agree on how to handle what few survivors they tracked back to camp. Befitting your role, the commanders turned to you to decide the fate of those who occupied prison pens. There were only enough prisoners to support the plan of a single army. So what does this favored want? The disfavored needed slaves to hold their gear, dig latrines and keep their mm, pallets warm at night. You can... You can consigned the survi survivors of battle to their subser subservient role among Craven Ash's noble troops. So basically make so basically made the captured uh, civilians, slaves and that sort of thing as as the servants of the disfavored soldiers, all right? And uh, Scarlet Chorus, you gave prisoners the chance to serve in Kairos's army or die. The Scarlet Chorus was in was in need of extra troops to fill up the vanguard, and your former enemies would occupy those slots nicely. This sounds also very nice. Now the next option, 
feeding the host. Against the most optimistic projections, the disfavored and Scar Scarlet Chorus made short work of the local defenses. They did so well that the armies quickly outpaced their supply caravans. Troops were plentiful, but food was scarce. You only had time to execute one plan to secure provisions. You authorized disfavored troops to confiscate food and supplies from traveling merchant caravans. The tears had already spent ignorant centuries glutting themselves outside of Chorus's law. Or you authorized the Scarlet Chorus to send their horde out to pillage from our farms and villages, spreading the infamy of Chorus's army prepared the, t prepared the tears for the reality of the impending conquest. I think that this is more interesting choice. Hmm. I think we are just gonna... Actually... I think that this, this favorite can survive without some servants of their own. So let's just go with this. We are gonna. We need more. We need more troops. You armed. You armed cooperative ex soldiers with scrap weapons and tossed them into the vanguard of the next scarlet chorus assault. Those who those who survived were welcome to take up the arms arms to take up the arms and armor of the falling and eke out a desperate struggle to survive in Karus's military. After their first victory, you rewarded the new recruits with the opportunity to execute their wounded or re reluctant countrymen. Taking the Bastard City The armies of Kairos amassed around the Bastard City, the first bastion of the Tears to fall. Both armies, both armies longed to storm their walled outpost. The, Scar the Scarlet Chorus, how howling for plunder and the disfavored for forming an unbreakable shield wall. Your proudness on the field of battle had carried them this far, but there was one more step before total victory. Both of the armies had inspired Sheems, of, Sheems to take the bastard city. Which did you support? So... Oh, we, and we, get, a new, and we get the abilities, and uh, depending on our choices. You joined the disfavored vanguard in a direct assault upon the city gates. No fortification would stand before the unstoppable legion. And what does this do? Warriors that respite. Stand your crown in the face of defeat. During this time you will regenerate health rapidly, but your damage is significantly reduced. Well, that, well, that, that doesn't sound very fun, to be honest. You joined the Scarlet Chorus in setting fire to the city and blocking the gates. The, de the defenders would surrender or burn. Brutal. Searing palm. Gather heated energy into your hands and release it on, on uh, and release it onto your onto a foe. The target ignites in flames, burning over time. This doesn't really sound like what uh, what my character would do, to be honest with you. So yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick this one. What about this? You let a mixed band of this favorite and Scarlet Chorus scouts over the city walls to sabotage its defenses. And what does this do? Conceal in shadows. Create a cloud of create a cloud of obscuring shadows and lust and dust for a short duration enemies that use physical attacks against you have a, have a slightly increased chance to miss during this time your attacks will also be less effective this sounds like a very much like a rogue thief kind of uh, ability mm, it's either worry it's either the disfavored or mix of the or a mix of the two Hmm. Let's just go with this. I uh, I like to, I uh, I would also like to see how this how the how this works in in practice. So let's go with this. Though it was though it was challenging to earn the cooperation of both armies, their shared interest in taking down the city defenses allowed your scouts to work as a single unit. Once your forces scaled the walls, a mixture, a mixture of tactics and savagery de destabilized the city guard, who quickly lost their command over the defenses and were, focused to, and were forced to surrender. Lacking the support of archers or siege weapons, the bastard city fell quickly to Karus' superior might. And then, the bastard... The Bastard City settled into a new state of normalcy, with every tower displaying Karus's banner. Your name was whispered along uh, alongside rumors of a decorated career to come. The armies divided into two fronts and migrated south. 
to none sent word that you were to join the next frontier of Kairos' conquest, either as judge and overseer of the settlement of Leeton's Crossing. What's Leeton's Crossing? Built in the shadow of an old wind, old wall junction in the realm of Haven, Leeton's Junction is a growing trading settlement. The nearby rivers are rich in iron ore, though, though the locals lack the technology to smelt and forge the element. Uh, in the years following Kairos' conquest of the Tears, the population of Legion's Crossing swelled with refugees f fleeing the destruction of their homelands. The presence of the forge-bound mining the iron, along with the guards, make this make sh makes this makeshift settlement a vital resource for Kairos' armies. Alright. So where were we? Either as judge and overseer of the settlement of Legion's Crossing, or as a war advisor with the armies advancing into the realm of Apex. So, oh, so either Leeton, Leeton's Crossing or Apex. The troops of the mountain realm of Apex stood idle in the safety of their valley, building their time as their neighbors in the bastard Teofel in the second year of war, and joint, for, and joint force of the disfavored and scarlet Chorus crossed over the mountains to take control of the Tears central, Tears central valley. I think we go to Lethal's Crossing because having that all that iron sounds very nice and useful to us. Four twenty nine, year two of Kairos' conquest. Lethal's Crossing. Years ago, Lethal Lethal the Bold founded a small merchant town at the at the intersection of ancient old walls. A pact between the settlers and a mercenary company meant that caravans were able to travel without fear of bandits or bane, and the town thrived in modest insignificance. Leeton's crossing drew Kairos' attention for the iron deposits in the surrounding hills. With the region under Kairos' control, the northern smith mages could set up workshops to refine ore and arm the disfavored with the finest weapons in the known world. The Archon of Secrets dismantled the mercenary support with a, with a generous bribe, taking the crossing in a bloodless victory. Tunon dispatched you to travel alongside Kairos' forces and bring order to the region. The Iron Must Flow Kairos' smith mages worked day and night to create weapons. No one faulted their ded dedication, yet production was slow. The plans that came to light proved approved divisive to the disfavored and scarlet colors. On one hand, any additional manpower was needed for fighters, not forges. On the other hand, the celebrated weaponry of Kairos' army is needed to be fiercely guarded. And the scarlet chorus, scarlet chorus took refugees from the recent influx and forced them to serve in Kairos' military. You repurposed these individuals to haul wagons, wagons, for, wagons of iron for the smith mages. This proved an inconvenience to the Scarlet Chorus, who relied on their force of numbers to be effective in the field. Or, you conscripted help from a local tribe of beastmen. Their strength would, would more than of offset their disobedience. The disfavored pro protested that savages have access to the secrets of iron, but their voices were few compared to the support of the Scarlet Chorus. I actually like this one because, like, because, like me, but because in the character creation we decided that um, our character was raised by the beastmen, so so interaction with beastmen would be this character's speciality. But before we pick that, what's this? The Cult of Sirin. Sirin, Archer of Song, used her arcane charm to lure locals into, the, into joining Kairos' army. As a patroness of the Scarlet Chorus, her efforts were critical to the conscription of new recruits. When an enthralled, disfavored soldier joined her cult, his company feared that the Archon was growing out of control and needed to be stopped. The disfavored demanded that the Archon of Song keys her recruitment practices and that they, and that they be allowed to violent subdue her cult of followers. The toss of soldiers was a significant setback to the Scarlet, Scarlet Chorus' cons conscription efforts. The Scarlet Chorus tradition, you sent the latest batch of cultists to the front lines of the Apex campaign. Those who, those who survived were welcome to remain in Chorus' military, and their performance would stand as testimony to Cyrus' effectiveness. Well, yeah, I'm not 
gonna bother with that. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just gonna pick this. He conscripted help from local tribe of beastmen. The Scarlet Chorus were overjoyed to learn of a beastman conscription and graciously lent their support to your cause. The local beastmen were subdued and yoked to iron beer in wagons, wagons, where their boundless strength and tirelessness proved critical to the smith mages. The disfavored grew agitated about exposing the secrets of iron to savages. You attempted to ally their concerns, but your words fell flat before a stu stubborn, uncompromising audience. Oh, there's lots of reading here, folks. Well, just like I said they would. Pick of the armory. Since you aided the production of weapons, commanders of both armies lobbied for additional arms. They offered all manner of bribes to be next in line for a fitting session with the masters of the forge. How did you save the lust for iron? You let the disfavored have the iron, keeping their best tools in the hands of the elite. The Scarlet Chorus saw the slight saw the slight as an obvious display of prefer preferential treatment. You gave the you gave iron arms to the Scarlet Chorus commanders, knowing they pay well for any killing tool. Weaponry of such acclaim was typically reserved for the highest disfavored officers, but you were open to changing tradition under the circumstances. Or you allowed no changes to the orderly di dispension of iron and punished those who tried to bribe you twice. Or a guardian stew. Curse's armies used Lethin's crossing as a repre reprieve from, from the war. The city grew more crowded as a mercenary army, hired by the Archon of Secrets, occupied the barracks where they trained resources and esca escalated tensions. The, the disfavored wanted nothing to do with the cell swords, but the Scarlet Chorus sought to invite them into the fold. The disfavored demanded that the mercenaries be kept far from Karas' armies. The rightness occupiers would not dine to share provisions or supplies with the Degenerate cell swords. You built a separate barracks and um, and and mess hall in order to keep the cell swords out of the army's way, and 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 enacted strict laws against disorderly conduct. You let the Scarlet Chorus and the mercenaries engage in combat games and challenges, and allowed laws against revelry and merriment to go un, un, unenforced. Those who won the contest took a, great, took a greater share of provisions, and sell sorts of merit were invited to join Karas' army. Hmm. I think this is a bit more interesting choice to make. I think this is a bit boring. Uh, remain neutral. This is a bit boring uh, choice to make. But logically, but logically thinking, the disfavored are the elite of the elite of Kairos' armies, at least in, in this part of the uh, conque conquested world. So it kind of would make sense that let's give the best weapons to the best soldiers. I mean, after all, the Scarlet Chorus are nothing but simple uh, slaves, slaves, bandits, cap captured civilians, and, 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 any, and all those kind of people who are not nearly as effective in combat and as it is favored. They are all about numbers. Let's pick the disfavored for this one. Passing out iron to even the heart to even the hardest scarlet chorus. Um, passing out iron to even the hardest scarlet chorus gang boss would have been a waste of resources. Most of them wouldn't, couldn't wield arms more more complicated than, than a pitchfork, and their chances of chances of surviving a fortnight were suspect. Yeah, that's what I thought too. The disfavored, by contrast, knew how to use and respect a cap capable uh, weapon to its greatest potential. Perhaps more importantly, the disfavored, the disfavored remember their friends when a time of need arises, and their loyalty runs as deep as, as any vein of iron ore. As any vein of iron ore. Who controlled the crossing? Strategy has struck when a mercenary hired hired by the voices of Nerad injured a forge bound. What's a forge bound? Oh, there's a lot of text here. The forge bound are made smiths worn to carry the service, though the though the operations in the tiers are overse overseen by Tunon and his court of freightbinders. Each 
Each forge part uses magic as a tool to augment the personal craft, most commonly smelting and metalworking, but carpenters, sailors and tanners are found in the ranks, and each mage strives to create that which is, which is impossible with mundane hands. Most notably, the Forgebound are the sole masters of iron, working in the known world. Using spells of fire resistance to wade into the forge fires, the Forgebound can work iron at temperatures no other forge can match, and with the hands and with the hands-on touch that no mundane smith could hope to achieve. Because of this vital skill, the Forgebound are considered a strategic war asset. Their lives, their lives regimented and controlled so that the forges may churn out, churn out iron, iron arms and armor without debate, delay or distraction. So that's what they are. So basically like blacksmith mages, kinda. Anyway, so strategy struck when a, when a mercenary hired by the voice of Nerat injured a forgebound artisan, leaving him unable to practice his craft. Tunon ordered the mercenaries to leave the city in the hands of Kairos's more responsible servants. Only a Tolkien garrison could be left behind while the armies returned to the front, as the disfavored and scarlet Skoros uh, showed increasing tension and hostility towards each other, Tunon decreed it best that only one force controlled the crossing. Who controlled the crossing? You granted the control of Leton's crossing to the disfavored, or you granted control of the Leton's crossing to the Scarlet Skoros? Hmm. Well, let's just pick Scarlet, Scarlet Scholars. I don't think that this actually has, has much meaning. Or maybe it has much, I don't know. We'll see. Who controlled the crossing? The Scarlet Scholars flew the Lethian's crossing with, an, with over-eager and undisciplined recruits. In the first few days of occupation, settlers uh, suffered under rampant theft, murder, rape and arson. By the following week, the horsemen who sowed chaos for personal gain were dead. Strung up by the more disciplined half that took up took up the reins as the self-appointed bosses of Leeds Crossing, the forge bound and continued to mint iron weapons and armor, which Kairos's merchant uh, carted to the disfavored garrisons than elsewhere in the tiers. Shipments were light or sometimes absent. The Scarlet Coros quartermaster claimed ignorance of the matter. Or maybe I should have picked the disfavored there. They could have hand handled the place and bit in a more, well, classic manner. But anyway, with the mercenaries expelled and Leedon's crossing under the under new leadership, Kairos' forces congratulated themselves on bringing order to the settlement and guaranteeing a productive flow of resources. Over the course of this diversion, the army front advanced further into the tiers. Your skills were needed in the realm of Asura, Stalwart or the Velium Citadel. What's Vellum Citadel? The Vellum Citadel was a library fortress, the, the largest archive of the written word in the tiers. The School of Ink and Gil protected and maintained the archive of ancient lore for centuries, standing apart from the political upheavals of the younger realms as an enduring pillar of knowledge and culture. Doesn't sound, doesn't sound like, like a place my character would be interested in in one bit. So I think we are going to ignore this place completely. So, Stalwart, with its easy de easy defend easily defended position and rich military tradition, the realm of Stalwart was the most formidable realm in the tiers. Or Asura, Kairos dispatched the Archon of Stone to subjugate the nation of Asura. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, let's, I don't know, let's go to Stalwart. Four thirty year, year three of Kairos' conquest. Stalwart. The realm of Stalwart, Stalwart was best known for its proud army, army, disciplined, courageous and undefeated on their home soil. Still, and Skill and resolve made Stalwart a military power that Kairos' force approached with due caution. With its southern position, Stalwart has had been largely safe from war. Watching for two years as its neighbors fell to Kairos' forces, on the, 
On the dawn of the third year of war, Karas' forces finally uh, poised to invade the stalwart, stalwart peninsula. They subdue the tier's most vanded army. Alright. Marching, uh, marching on em empty. The stalwart defenders burned their crops as they retreated, leaving the invaders little to, little to forage. Starving, the Scarlet Chorus mob, raid, mob raided from the disfavored, well-maintained supply, supply lines, incurring casualties on both sides. What? Those two have started to fight against each other now? Come on now. He ordered that the thieving Scarlet Soros soldiers be spiked for their... He ordered that the thieving Scarlet Soros soldiers be spiked for their affront. Or... By your command, this favorite shared their provisions. The thieves each the thieves each lost a hand for their treachery. Hmm. Well there is not well there is not much up uh, well uh, well a soldier who, who with an empty stomach is not very effective, so I guess I should uh, uh share share the uh, rations, but or the food, but let's see what this is. A, a continuous setback. After a, after a defeat at the hands of enemy defenders, the Scarlet Chorus accused the disfavored of rec recklessness. The disfavored claimed the Scarlet Chorus brought, brought too few soldiers to cover their flanks. Both armies refused to march until you crave a ruling. Knowing the disfavored reputation for discipline, as well as the Scarlet Chorus's powers to instill fear and frenzy, you decided that the Scarlet Chorus was in the wrong. Or, lacking proof that the Scarlet Chorus recruits were ne negligent, 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 you punished the disfavored commander for his failure and for bringing charges without evidence. Hmm. Tough choices, tough choices, folks. Hmm. Sorry, if, sorry if I'm being quiet right now. I'm just trying to, uh, just trying to decide. These are very tough choices, folks. And these, and and these can change the uh, the environments, the, the environments of the world of the world as you start the game, uh, depending on your choices. So this is, so that's why these these can be very crucial choices. I don't know how crucial, but they can be very crucial. Hmm. I don't know. Let's pick this. A Scarlet Chorus were were non-plus to receive some censure, but a cast but a cast that the disfavored would not share share in the blame. Soldiers hold venomous accusations your way, challenging your import impartiality and wondering where justice could be found, if not in Tunon's fate binder. They argue that reputation should have no bearing on law. So the Scarlet Chorus is not, uh, not it, so the Scarlet Chorus folks are not big fans of me right now. Uh, negative conscription. 
Scarlet's Chorus soldiers were spotted fighting alongside the Star Wars defenders. The voice of Nirat insisted they were spies and listened to cloak the army's weaknesses and so dis discontent. The disfavored accused the soldiers of treason and demanded bloody re re uh, reprisal. Repris Don't know that word. The, con the con contentious army sought your ruling on the matter. You ordered the disfavored to ex execute these spies uh, when they were found and demanded a full accounting of the so called agents from the Scarlet Chorus. Trusting that Karas' spy master knew his business, you ordered the disfavored to ignore the Scarlet Chorus agents. Alright, what about this one? Fall of the Regents. The armies of Kairos collaborated on the capture of an enemy lad leader. The Scarlet Chorus requested that the requested that she interrogated by the Archon of Secrets. The disfavored wished to display her corpse in battle, since the stalwart defenders refused to surrender. A gesture, a gesture was needed to instill fear. You ordered the enemy commander executed, her body displayed as a warning for those who would defy the overlord. Or you order that the enemy commander be sent to the voice of Nerad for in interrogation. This sounds more sensible to me, rather than just kill her straight away. Well, I'm gonna pick this one. Let's trust the spy ma spy ma spy master's plans. Against their better instincts, the disfavored showed restraint in avoiding the Scarlet Chorus operatives on the battlefield. When days passed and the Chorus agents agents didn't report back to camp, you questioned the voice of Nerad on his claims, to which he cautioned to which he cautioned patience. Several evenings later, one of the so-called spies sh shambled into the Scarlet Chorus camp and requested an audience with the voices. No one knew what they discussed in the privacy of his tent, and no one ever saw the soldier again. The voices of Nirad emerged with a quiet sense of accomplishment, saying, Only trust us, it will work, work out in our favor. Alright, well let's trust you, even though it might be a terrible idea. The Edict of Storms. The disfavored carved a slow, steady path into the heart of Stalwart and surrounded the en enemy's massive fortress, with the main bulk of their forces defeated. The enemy leadership re retreated to the mighty fortress, content to wa wait out the war. The Overlord answered this, this impotence with an edict. What's an edict? Kairos' most powerful magic is that of the Edict, commandments cast upon whole regions that can control and destroy man and nature alike. Once cast, an, an Edict can ed rain fire with crops, demoralize cities, usher in an endless night, or do whatever it is that Kairos envisioned. No known force, magical or mundane, can stop an Edict, though, an each, though each Edict is often worded to include some condition or contingency. Contingency, contingency that will see its end. Some edicts have been short-lived, delivering days of random catastrophe, just as many lingered for gen centuries. So that's an edict. Sounds like a very, very, very strong spell. And so anyway, the overall answer to this impotence with an edict of storms on the peninsula, a devastating spell that would endure for as long as the cowardly hearts of Star Wars leaders persisted in beating. Pleased by your efforts, Tunon deemed you the proper representative to, to deliver Karas' edict. Aside from being given a three-day window to read the edict, you received no other instructions. All right. Agreeing with the wishes of the disfavored, you proclaimed the edict at once, leaving the enemy no time to react. Starward had ample opportunity to surrender for several years. The time for mercy was long gone. Or, in, in an attempt to... In uh, incretiate, incretiate themselves with the people of Stalwart, the Scarlet Chorus insisted that, war that warning be sent out, out, out to the towns and villages so that the people may prepare for the horror about, about to descend, descend on them. Hmm.
Ah, tough choices, folks. Agreeing with the wishes of the disfavored, you proclaimed the edict at once, leaving the enemy no time to react. Stalwart had ample opportunities to surrender for several years. The time for mercy was long gone. In an attempt to to incratiate, I have no idea what that word is, incratiate themselves with the people of Stalwart, the Scarlet's Chorus insisted that the warning that warning be sent out to the to the towns and villages so that people may prepare for the horror about to be about to descend on them. I mean, why does he care if, if the... Oh, wait. Well, he does need more soldiers uh, from villages and towns. So I guess that's why he doesn't want doesn't want them to be killed straight away. Yeah, let's pick this one. You agreed with the disfavored rationale. The leaders of Stalwart had refused honorable had refused honorable battle, and too many disfavored lives were lost in the campaign. Since the last regent refused to leave the keep, you would let him watch as his people suffered. Without hesitation or regret, you broke the seal of Karos' Edict of Storms and read the Overlord's in incanta incantation. The Edict of Storms the clear skies darkened as you read the final words of the edict. A flurry of wind and rain whipped through the rolling plains and cracky canyons, turning rocks, uprooted trees, and hapless soldiers into has has hazardous sharp sharpnel. Armed with a measure, measure of foresight, you were able to remove yourself from the area before the storm grew more violent. O over time, nearby communities, communities told of sight. Over, over time, nearby communities told of cyclones consisting of thousands of soldiers worth of limbs, spears, armor, and skulls. What's more, the weather showed no sign of dissipating. Dissipating. Several units of disfavored who fought the enemy in, enemy in spite of the advancing storm were caught up in the Overlord's magic. The few survivors regroup, regrouped and nursed their wounds. Their failure to topple the stalwart legion shamed them into believing the dead, uh, into believing the dead more fortunate. Excuse me. The name stalwart fell from use. People took to calling it the plate grave, for the remade landscape festooned with the iron and bronze armaments of two of two once great legions. As Karas's forces departed. You spared a glance back at the ruins of Stalwart, marveling at your work. You didn't have long to rest before Tunon called you into service once more. And that's it, I guess. Ah, there it is. Conquest complete. You have reached the end of Karos' conquest. Do you want to continue or, or erase your progress and start over? Oh hell no, I'm not gonna read all of that again. I'm gonna lose my voice out of at this rate. So, we are gonna continue. A high, a high lore skill is required to create the most powerful spell combinations. Oh, so you can make your own spells in this game too. Oh, interesting. Maybe I should try a spellcaster of some kind when, in my next uh, playthrough, I may, when I make a new Let's Play as well. It sure is taking a sweet time to load this thing. I actually, I, ha I have actually watched uh, some reviews of this game, and there were some people who who, who indeed said that the loading times are very uh, can be quite long, and sometimes the game can even crash because of that. So let's hope that that doesn't happen in that happen here. Come on now, I would like to end. I would like to end this episode. God, this is la lasting a, a way too long. I don't remember. I don't remember Pillars of Eternity's uh, uh, Pillars of Eternity's uh, loading screens being this long.
The year is 431. There we go. And Kairos' invasion has shattered all major opposition in the tiers. The Younger Realms, the Bastard Tier, the Free Cities. All who defied Kairos lay broken by battle or bowed in surrender. The two armies of the Overlord, the Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus, now control our lands. But our will is not yet extinguished, not entirely. In the Valley of Vendrian's Well, those of us unwilling to bow to Kairos have banded together in defiance. Violating an oath of surrender from two years prior, we have staged a bloody uprising, murdering the disfavored and Scarlet Chorus garrison in a midnight assault. With their main forces spread across the tiers, the disfavored and Scarlet Chorus redeploy to Vendrian's Well to crush the resistance, but months pass with no definitive battle. As disagreement and discord paralyze the Archons, we bide our time and wait for our message of insurrection to spread across the tiers. The Overlord is not amused, and Kairos has one message for the Archons. Crush the Oathbreakers or die. Kairos backs this threat with an edict, a magical commandment that can slay all in the valley should the order be ignored. The honor of proclaiming this edict fell to you. Sent across the mountains to Vendrian's Well, you carry the Overlord's Edict to read before the Archons. Oh, holy crap! As you finally make your way through the winding mountain passes into the valley, the ground trembles, and Kairos's magic seals the way behind you. You are trapped in Vendrian's Well, with Kairos' armies and the Oathbreakers. The only way to survive is to fulfill the terms of the Overlord's Edict, in any way that you can. Alright, so that's our object. So that's our uh, objective given to us by Kairos himself. Holy shit, that, that statue looks so dope. Fate by the rule, Kark, I presume. We have been expecting you. And this is where I'm going to end this epi epi episode, ladies and gents. Uh, I, uh, this, this, this episode really lasted still a bit longer than I wanted to, but... Hey, what can you do? This, this is what happens when you, uh, uh, when you, when, when you create a char char character in an uh, old-school computer role-playing game like this. Welcome to Terratus. If this is your first, if, if this is your first visit to the world of tyranny, watch for these windows to help you be, to help you become familiar familiar with the game. You can disable tutorial messages at any time from the game options menu. All right, good to know. But yeah, but I'm gonna end this episode here, and we and and in, and in the next episode we are actually we actually start our adventure. So, thank you for watching, and until next time, see ya.